Hey everyone, so it's been way too long since the last time I posted something here on my channel and um, yeah, so I feel quite bad about it because I did say that I'm going to post weekly content um, to share with you what I'm up to but to be honest, it's been quite stressful just thinking about posting weekly and um, I've been juggling quite a few things one of them is the cello so um, some of you guys will already know that I picked up the cello um, April, uh, end of April, so it's been a couple of months. And yeah, I'm really enjoying the whole learning process. I call it my big violin because it's just huge. Um, but yeah, it's been really fun learning about it. And yeah, so today I'm hoping to make it up to you guys by sharing with you what it's been like for the last three years. And to answer some of your questions, the ones that you've left on my last video, which is the Bach uh, Adagio, where I played Bach Adagio. So yeah, I hope you will enjoy this video. Okay, so the first question is from Lee Gordon C. Bach. But before I read his question, I just want to quickly thank you, Lee, for sending me this beautiful book. This is called The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. And for those of you guys who don't know Lee, he is a professional artist. And I am so, so honored to receive this gift. This is just exactly what I need to be reading right now. And I can already tell you that I will be going back to it as soon as I finish it just because there's so many lessons to learn. So I will link in the description Lee's website if you guys are interested in checking out his work. I especially love the way that he captures um, movement in water and these these paintings, when I look at them, I I feel like I'm looking at someone's memories and it's just the way that you capture emotion in your paintings is just really beautiful. So. Uh, congratulations on three years with this beautiful instrument. Um, yes, I have a burning question, but first I believe that achievement in art is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Yes. Um, did you work through Beth's videos, taking it slowly and deliberately to get things right from the very beginning, establishing good techniques such as good bowstroke? The reason I ask is because that's what I'm doing since I strongly believe in fundamentals. Everything I've ever done or taught, music, tennis, painting, drawing, always stems from the basics. I've noticed that most of my students have glossed over them because they're in a big hurry. So I'm wondering if that's how you achieved your skill on the violin. So the short answer for this question is that I followed the beginning lessons very strictly. Um, I didn't know much about the violin when I first started, um, and so it was so interesting for me. I was so engaged with what I was learning. Um, you know, the littlest things like naming the different parts of the violin was fun for me to learn, and um, you know, bowing straight how to hold the violin, those type of things. And I went over Suzuki Book 1 pretty quickly within the first couple of months, I would say. And after that, I wasn't so sure about um, continuing with the Suzuki repertoire, just because I had discovered um, pieces from the likes of um, Meditation from Thais, uh, Schindler's List, Chopin's Nocturne in C-sharp minor, um, of course the Canzonetta, which is the second movement of Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto. So these things are <laughs> pulling me in the direction that I wasn't supposed to go to. Um, because when I was starting, I actually thought to myself that in order for me to progress uh, well, I must stick to the syllabus that was in Violin Lab. And I had full intention of doing that, except that I was, I was just being <laughs> pulled in that direction, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and yeah, so I think one of the reasons why I, I let myself get distracted by these pieces is because it was aligned to what I wanted to learn. I think that um, for those of you guys who are new to my channel and don't know, my biggest goal is to be able to play the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto and I knew that the easiest way to get into this um, concerto is the slow movement first. Certainly the first movement is 
there's a lot of shifts involved, but I think the the second movement is um, easier to get into. And so I was thinking, um, if I just study the meditation from Thais and all of these other pieces, it would help me get a better understanding of how the notes are laid out on the violin, just because it's so hard to be able to perceive where their notes are. Um, so I said to myself that if I was going to learn something, um, it better be something that I am interested in learning. Otherwise, I would just go through, um, I would gloss over them in a sense because my heart is not in it. So I, I studied those pieces and if you look through my older videos, I posted some of my progress along the way. So I would characterize my learning for the first couple of years as pretty self-indulgent. Um, I didn't play any etudes or scales and certainly I wasn't developing my sight reading, which meant that when I attended the violin lab workshop, I struggled quite a lot. After the first two years, that's when I started incorporating some etudes. I'm still struggling to make scales a good part of my practice, um, but it's so much better than the first couple of years, definitely. I prioritized um, pleasure in playing more than um, anything else because I think that you know, it's it's really hard to practice when your heart is not in it. And so, you know, being able to learn these pieces, it, it was difficult, but it was almost, I can almost tolerate the frustration that comes with learning. So that's pretty much what it was like for me in a nutshell. I think that a lot of us loses the spark too early and um, which makes us give up too soon. So for me, I was very concerned with that. I didn't want it to be a chore because I wanted to stick to it for as long as I can. So, so the next two questions are practice related questions. And these are my most commonly asked questions actually. So um, Anna, was asking how many hours a day do you practice on the violin? And Pat Omate is asking what is your practice routine? Around this time last year, I made the effort to keep track of my practice hours. And if you guys didn't see it, I will insert a clip of that video so you guys can have a look at my numbers. I will put up a screenshot of my vlog right now so that you can see what's on my phone um, so I practiced 12 days out of the 28 days of the month and the longest time I practice without any breaks is about 90 minutes and the least amount of playing I did was around 15 minutes so earlier this year I consciously made the effort to do at least two hours of daily practice of course some days I'm not able to so I try not to sweat it. I try to look at the bigger picture and, you know, um, being consistent at it. Um, but recently, I would say maybe an hour or an hour and a half is good because I'm juggling a couple of instruments now. So with my practice routine, I always make the effort to um, to make sure that my setup is correct. And I would actually um, adjust my my shoulder rest quite a bit at the beginning for the first few minutes, just because I feel like if tension is creeping up, then I have to um, do something because otherwise it just, uh, it makes playing very difficult. So um, I make sure that my violin hold is nice and relaxed. And with pieces like the one I just played for you guys, the Bach Andante, um, I feel like my shoulder tends to raise a little bit. So I I give myself the command to just relax the shoulder. And I talk to myself quite a bit. Um, and I make sure that my bow hold, uh, my violin hold, is at the right angle so sometimes it could be too far back here or 
sometimes it may be too forward. So the way that I measure my um, my violin hold is by putting my bow onto the string. So the idea is to hold the violin according to your arm length. Um, and this is because I have pretty short arm, I think. If you look at David Oistrak, he's very... He's got a pretty short arm too, but he's able to reach the extreme um, parts of the bow. And so the idea is to adjust the violin hold depending on your arm length. And for me, it's about here. So I make the effort to keep the violin in this angle. And um, the next thing I do, of course, is just open strings. I tune my violin and I do open strings because uh, I feel like if I am able to hear the ringtones earlier on, I'm able to play more in tune. And um, I usually don't do scales. I jump into the piece that I'm working on right away. But if I do feel like I need some warming up, I go to Wolfheart. Um, Kreutzer and um, let's see something that I've been playing for a while that I feel comfortable to warm up with um, something that is not going to induce any kind of tension um, is what I gravitate towards and yeah there's really nothing to it I focus on the hard sections of the piece and make it sound as good as I can so working on my intonation uh, my bowing and that sort of thing so yeah I am uh, at the moment I'm working through um, the Suzuki book four so I have two more pieces to uh, learn from that book the perpetual motion and the Bach uh, double concerto and the Bach solo works I am usually playing some sort from this book um, I so the new thing from this book that I'm learning is the jig from partita number two and yeah that's pretty much what my routine looks like so the next question is about intonation um, this is from the cosmos it says here may I ask if you have any tips for not getting frustrated and discouraged when practicing or learning a piece, especially intonation-wise. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, the first thing I would say is if you look at my um, my music, you would see a lot of check marks next to the staff that I've read through. And I think I've read it in Simon's, Simon Fisher's book or something. But basically, the reason why I do this is um, it gives me the feeling of um, accomplishing something when I practice. And the next time that I practice, when I see those check marks, it feels less scary to go over them. I don't know if you can relate to this, but if I'm starting a new piece, it feels a little bit intimidating to just start it. But as soon as I put like some form of markings, I'm okay. And um, Certainly the ones that I played in the past where I put the check marks next to um, I feel like I can do them right away um, So that's one thing that you know if you haven't tried doing maybe you could try Then for intonation, there's a few things that I do if you don't have this app. I highly recommend it. it's called tonal energy uh, from the app store and uh, basically, it has a few functionalities that may interest you. So it has a drone functionality, so it can produce a pitch um, like this. So if I if I pluck the G string and if I sorry, it changes when I speak into it. It um, registers different notes. So if I pluck it and then press and hold, it will produce a drone. Can you hear? So while I'm playing, I'm able to have a reference note in the background so that when it, when it sounds off, I can spot it right away. So second tip is for 
drone practice and then the other thing is you can use this app to actually um, to play something and to see how off you are so it gives you a visual feedback of um, how how low or how high you are <laughs> It gives you like, what does it say, sense. And my D is slightly higher, so I can, I'll probably need to adjust it. But um, the idea is to have a visual feedback of what you're playing. And then the other thing is just uh, with your basic open strings. For me, these are this is my favorite. I didn't start playing with a drone until after a couple of years of playing. So my only reference note were the open strings. Um, I would compare So I would just compare um, whatever note I'm playing to the open strings. And you can even play play the open strings as a drone like this so it's just so satisfying to um, to to hear those overtones um, and it's it's just wonderful those are four tips already but the last one that I think would really um, impact your intonation is to just pay attention to your finger placement and what your finger needs to do to be in tune so I'll give you an example for um, this Bach piece that I played for you guys earlier it's uh, C and E now it's really hard to make these notes in tune and so what I do is I first tune I uh, listen to the open string of the G and I find the fourth that wedding march the here comes the bride well once you get that I want to compare it to the open string D it sounds off so I adjust find the C I place the first finger on D string for that E note and I lift it and I place it back lift and place in my mind I'm thinking should I go high or should I go low just by listening to the um, the way that these two notes bl uh, blend together so I am paying attention to my um, to my finger placement because that's really important I want to be able to anticipate whether I'm gonna have to uh, bring my elbow forward or bring it back so that I can place my fingers exactly what, where they're supposed to go. So yeah, those are my tips for intonation. I hope they help. So the last question is from Gino MSO. Um, he says, Congrats on three years. I'm an adult beginner and I love watching your videos. Could you tell us about your bow? Did it come with your violin or was it bought separately? And if yes, where? The sound it gives is so clear. Thank you for inspiring us adult learners and keep up the great work. Um, thank you so much for your um, question. So this bow here, I, I got with my violin. So I've had my violin for three years now. Um, and this is a Gliga violin, so I had the option to choose what kind of bow I wanted 
with my violin at the checkout. And for some of you guys who don't know, the Stender 2 came with a wooden bow. And so I was curious to try a carbon fiber bow for a change. And at first I didn't like this um, type of bow at all because it was, it felt a little bit heavier. And it felt like my fingers were um, lifting some heavy dumbbells or something. But I grew um, very fond of this. I, I think that um, you can just about get used to anything. But for me, I really like how balanced it feels on my hand. Plus, there's the advantage of never losing this, um, this curve. It's called the camber on the bow because it's just made so sturdy. So it's a carbon fiber bow. I don't know what the brand is, but um, I'll try to see what the name is in my receipt if I can find it. But this is a carbon fiber bow and I, I will show you quickly um, this section here. I don't know if you can see. Um, it's starting to wear off the, I think it's a leather uh, wrapping here. Um, so I'm a little bit uh, nervous about this completely wearing off, but you know, so far it's been, it's held up really well for the past three years. So I love this bow and I'm glad that you like the sound of this as well. Um, the only thing that I would mention is that with carbon fiber bow, because it doesn't vibrate, not like a wooden bow, it, it's, if you're not used to um, playing on a carbon fiber bow, it might feel like it's muted actually because it doesn't, you know how they say that it's like a match, It you have to find the perfect match for your violin because it imparts a certain tone quality um, but with a carbon fiber bow you don't get that because it doesn't vibrate so so before I go, I just want to quickly thank all of you guys who have been so lovely sending me all of these wonderful messages and um, I hope I can continue to make progress and inspire you guys to keep on playing as well. So yeah, thank you and I will see you in my next video.